to sing to. He is worthy to live for. And uh, so that's why we love him. Exodus chapter 3 this morning. Second book of the Bible, Exodus 3. Our theme for the year is no excuses. And so we are, once a month, I like to return to our theme that we've chosen for the year and uh, touch on that thought in the Word of God. And so uh, we began in January, and here we are in February, touching on this theme. And boy, uh, excuses are a part of our sin nature, aren't they? Uh, that's just, that's just uh, who we are, and because of our sin, because of our nature, we, we just try to get out of doing what we ought to do, and uh, we're all guilty of that at times, and so we need to be reminded uh, of, of what we're doing. Um, I do believe that God has has mightily blessed this church, and he's mightily blessed the people of this church for not using this crazy year, last year or so, that we've had as an excuse. Uh, it has not been used as an excuse to quit assembling and worshiping God the way he says to be worshiped in his word. It has not been used as an excuse to quit trying to reach souls for him. And so uh, God has blessed that mightily, that we have not used the recent news and things as an excuse. However, uh, we are all still excuse makers at times, myself included. And uh, we are very good at giving ourselves a pass. And that's just uh, what the flesh does. So it's helpful for us to occasionally be reminded of our own MO, <laughs> the MO of the flesh. Uh, last time... I began by reading a few humorous excuses that I found uh, that were real, that uh, had been with the Reader's Digest, but real excuses that people had made about coming into work and why they couldn't come into work. And so that was pretty funny. I found a few more, and this is not, not uh, adults going to excusing uh, a time off work. This is adults excusing their children from school. And so these are actual notes that parents had written to school administrators explaining why their child could not be in school that day. Please excuse Lisa for being absent. She was sick and I had her shot. <laughs> not how it sounds, I don't think. Dear school, I like how vague that uh, salutation is. Dear school, please excuse John being absent on January 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, and also 33. <laughs> John has been absent because I had two teeth taken out of his face. <laughs> yeah? That's, that's in general where they need to come out of. Brother Bob has taken some teeth out of some faces, I think, over the years. He's, he's a dentist. Uh, please excuse Ray from school on Friday. He had very loose vowels. With, with a V. Sounds like he needs to be in school more. <laughs> please excuse Jennifer for missing school yesterday. We forgot to get the Sunday paper off the porch, and when we found it Monday, we thought it was Sunday. So, oops. <laughs> and so as silly as those sound, uh, I'm sure some of the things that we reason in our heart to God sound just as silly uh, to get out of doing what we ought to do. And so last month, we introduced this theme. Last month, our passage was in Luke 14. And in Luke 14, we find a parable about a feast. And there are, uh, we read about those who were invited to the feast, and the feast is a picture of heaven. The feast is a picture of Christ. The feast is a picture of salvation. The feast is a picture of the gospel. Uh, and so people were invited to, to, the, to the feast, but to salvation and to Christ, and yet they all, with one consent, began to make excuse. And for one, it was land that they had purchased, and for one, it was oxen, and for the other, it was a spouse. Uh, but when you really, a new spouse, but when you get down to the heart of the issue, it wasn't about land, it wasn't about oxen, it wasn't about a spouse, it was about their true will and what they really wanted. And what they really wanted was to not go to the feast. And what people really want, they can make all the excuses and it's land and it's a spouse and it's oxen, but they don't want Christ, they don't want the gospel, they don't want transformation, they don't want truth. Uh, and so that's often why excuses are offered. That is the root issue. And so that's what we said last week, is that excuses reveal some things. 
They reveal our true will and what we really want. They reveal often our, our lack of faith. But another thing that excuses do that we pointed out last time is that they actually hurt us more than they help us. We think we're helping ourselves to get out of something, but really we're only hurting ourselves because the thing that we got out of would have been blessed had we done it. So really we rob ourselves of blessings. If we were to do what God wants us to do rather than wiggling out of it with excuses, God is a reward and he would have blessed. And and so we forfeit rewards and we forfeit blessings and we actually hurt ourselves more than we help ourselves. Probably that, that was the most notable maybe passage on excuses in the New Testament. But this morning we're going to look at maybe the next most noticeable passage in the Bible concerning excuses. And that is here in Exodus 3 and 4. This is where God is calling Moses. And Moses does not want to accept the call. So he makes excuses to try to get out of it. And so what was Moses being called to? Moses was being called to service. Moses was being called to leadership. And and you can make the comparison to, in the New Testament sense, when we kind of pull some principles from these Old Testament accounts and apply them to our day, you can make a pretty good comparison that, that, that evangelism is involved here too because what was Moses' call? To, to get people, to get souls in bondage to freedom. To get souls in bondage out of their chains and to liberty and to deliverance. And so that is... It sounds a lot like evangelism, doesn't it? Uh, To go out and pass out tracts and to talk to people and to bring up the gospel, uh, it's getting uh, an effort and an attempt to lead souls out of bondage, out of their chains, to liberty, where Jesus Christ hath made us free indeed. And So that comparison certainly can be made as well. Um, This passage that we'll look at in a minute, that we'll read in a minute, has been preached so fervently and fruitfully over the centuries to call men of God to, and women of God to full-time service for the Lord. Uh, into the ministry, this passage is a, a great portion of Scripture that's been used of God to call many into full-time ministry. And, of course, not everybody is called to full-time ministry, but many are. Not every, It wouldn't make sense for everybody to be called to full-time ministry, but many are, and sadly, many who are called make excuses and, and will not accept that call. This country is filled with pastorless churches. You know, we think of the big the big churches that have hundreds of people and a decent salary and a position of some status, and, and those pulpits are all filled. But you know how many? I mean, that's why our founding pastor went to Brandon, Manitoba. There was a, a couple dozen people there that were Baptists, that were saved, that had a church, but had been through some problems, and they were left without a pastor. And there's churches like that all over the country. And, and so there's there's a shortage of pastors. There's a dearth of pastors. Uh, we had Chris Myers preach here. He's on uh, the staff over at Skyview here in town, and he's preached for us back in October and maybe again here pretty soon. Uh, when Alyssa and I, we're still trying to figure out when our vacation is going to be because we don't know when things are allowed to happen, all right? So, uh, but he's surrendered to the call to, at first he thought, to start a new church. And so uh, Brother Chris has been out deciding where am I going to start a church. And in the process of deciding where to start a church, He's gotten about three dozen phone calls from churches that are a couple dozen people that just need a pastor. That whatever has happened, their pastor has died, and there just has not been enough Baptist pastors that know some doctrine and, and believe some truths that, that are have made themselves available. And he's got a another job as well that can just like I did that can assist him until a church gets kind of off the ground like we have. And so he's in demand. He's got about uh, he could go to Texas, he could go to California. And it just speaks to the fact that there's a shortage uh, of those in full-time ministry. Um, one of the best funerals that I've ever been to, not that funerals are fun, but uh, my, one of my heroes, Dr. Roy Thompson, who started the Cleveland Baptist Church in 1958, uh, he, I was at his funeral service in 2010, and the huge auditorium packed out. And there was a point in the service where it, the question was put out, if you were, if you were called to full-time ministry uh, under his under his preaching, would you stand? And I looked around, and there was at least 100, maybe 200 people standing. And I thought, wow, what a testament to the power of God on a man's ministry. What a beautiful testament to the power of God on that church. Wouldn't that be a great prayer for our church? That over the years, until the Lord returns, that we'd have 100 
or two. What an honor that would be for us to be the church where where excuses are are thrown out, thrown out and not used, and where a call to full time service is accepted and surrendered to. God, do that here. Oh Lord, do that here. Many times over. What a what an honor that would be. And so you're familiar with the story of Moses. He is an Israelite. He is of the tribe of Levi, but he's raised by Pharaoh's daughter in, uh, in the home of Pharaoh, in, in an Egyptian home. And so uh, he's growing up as an Egyptian, but yet God has put within him an affinity uh, and a zeal for his people Israel. And he went a little overboard on that zeal and killed a man. Uh, and so at age 40, he's now committed a murder, and he's forced to flee. He's a wanted man, and so he leaves Egypt and leaves the people of Israel and he's out in Midian and he's out in Midian in the backside of the desert. He meets a man, uh, the daughters of a man named Jethro, a priest of Midian. Jethro has seven daughters and Moses marries one of them. He marries Zipporah and they have children and Moses spends the next 40 years of his life as a Midianite, as a shepherd. And so he's 80 years old and here he is in Exodus chapter three. He's, he's lived uh, 80 years already and he's been uh, in Midian for 40 years he has not seen his people, Israel, in 40 years. He hasn't been to Egypt in 40 years. His brother's there. His sister's there. Uh, but he's pretty comfortable in Midian. And so God gets his attention. Exodus chapter 3, verse 1 says, Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And I love Moses' self-commentary here. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. <laughs> it's like he's on Facebook commenting on his day. <laughs> Verse 4. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land unto a good land and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppress them. Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Again, Lord, we need you to be present. We need your Holy Spirit to move here in our midst if we will be helped, if we will grow, uh, if we will allow you to work in our lives here. Uh, we need the, uh, the Holy Spirit to penetrate us, and so we surrender ourselves to you. Free us from distractions, and may we uh, may we listen to you carefully and to your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So there's a few excuses. There are four excuses that are made here. The first one, so, so that's the call. That's the burning bush. The first excuse is found in verse 11. And Moses said unto God, well, who am I that I should go into Pharaoh, that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? Moses says, well, why me? Why should I be the one that does this? Don't, you know, I, I haven't been there in 40 years. I haven't even been with Israel in 40 years. Why me? I'm just a lowly shepherd. I'm a Midianite now, Lord. It's like he's saying, I'm not an Israelite anymore. I'm a Midian. I've moved. Why me? And deep down, he knew why him. There's one Hebrew who is as familiar as Moses is with the inner workings of the government of Egypt. There's one. He's the perfect choice, and he knows. Who else was grew up in the house of Pharaoh? He was raised by Pharaoh's daughter, which means the Pharaoh at the time would have been like a grandfather to him. How many other Hebrews could say that? How many other Israelites could say that? None. 
And, and in all probability, 80 years later, the Pharaoh that had been as a grandfather to Moses as a child probably was long dead by, by then. And it's a different man who's assumed the title of Pharaoh. Pharaoh isn't a name, it's a title, like president, and there were many. And so the current Pharaoh at the time of the burning bush is probably a man that Moses had never met. However, he has more of, an, of a rare and unique insider's perspective and understanding of the way that the Egyptian government works than anyone else. And so he really is the perfect choice. But he makes his next excuse in verse 13. It says, And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall, they shall say to me, What is his name? Well, what shall I say? His excuse is, they're going to ask me questions that I don't know the answer to. And, and God's response is, I'll give you the answers. <laughs> I, of course you don't have them. I have them, and I'll give them to you. So, well, well who am I? That's number one. Who am I? I, I shouldn't be the one. And, and well, I, I'm ignorant, and I don't have the knowledge, and I don't know what to say. And then the third excuse is found in chapter 4 and verse 1. Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice. For they will say, the Lord hath not appeared unto me. So he says, well, they're not going to believe and they're not going to listen. So who am I? Um, what do I do if I don't know what to say? They're not going to believe. They're not going to listen. And then chapter 4 and verse 10 is the fourth excuse. Moses said unto the Lord, oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent. Neither here to, uh, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant. But I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. Um, there's a couple of different ideas about what his excuse really is here. He says, I'm not eloquent, I'm of slow speech, I'm of a slow tongue. Maybe that has to do with languages, that he could speak Hebrew, we know that. He could speak Egyptian, we know that. But perhaps he had spent four decades speaking Midianite, and his excuse is that, Lord, my Egyptian is rusty. Lord, my Hebrew is rusty. I'm going to have to speak to my, our people and to Pharaoh, and, and so I, I don't remember. It's been 40 years since I've spoken those languages. Maybe that's what he meant. Uh, or perhaps what he meant was that he, he has a stuttering problem, a speech impediment. Uh, and there are many that have that issue. And so that could be what he's referring to. Um, but it's interesting how the Holy Spirit removes that excuse too. Because Moses said, oh, I'm not eloquent. I'm not articulate. I'm slow. Jot down if you're in the habit of jotting down verse references, Acts 7, 22, next to Exodus 4, 10. Acts 7, 22. In Exodus 7.22, the Holy Spirit, through Stephen, is recounting what happened with Moses. And it says that by age 40, so he's 80 now. So by age 40, it says that Moses was mighty in words. Mighty in words. So I'm not so sure about the validity of the excuse of not being eloquent. If no, he was mighty in words already by then. So the, and that's what the Lord kept doing, exposing every excuse for what it is. Everything that Moses could come up with and conjure up, the Lord's response was, I'll, I'll be with thee. I'll take care of that. I'll provide for that. I'll solve that. I'll handle that. Don't worry, I've got that covered. Every single thing that Moses offered as an excuse, the Lord kept shooting down. And that's what God does. <laughs> he is, our God is the ultimate excuse remover. That's, that's something he specializes in, and that's what he did for Moses here. Is, is, you know, if, if Moses had come up with ten more, the Lord would have poked holes in all ten. Uh, because the Lord was saying, I'm calling you. I've got this all under control. I'll take care of all of these things. And so, by chapter 4 and verse 13, Exodus 4, 13, and he said, Oh my Lord, send, I pray thee, by the hand of of him whom thou wilt send, and the anger of the Lord was kindled. So after he tries one, and that's shot down, and he tries two, and that's shot down, after he gets through four, Moses realizes he can't come up with any more. He's, he's got writer's block. He's got excuse maker's block. And, and so he just he just gets down to the heart of these. He says, look, just I don't want to send anybody but me. Send somebody else, but don't send me. And really, that's what his first four excuses translate to. What he really meant when he gave the other four excuses is, I just don't want it to be me. I just want it to be somebody else. And so that's our title this morning, Translating Our Excuses. When we make excuses, what are we really saying? Can, can we decode what our, our flesh is really saying? Um, I like to listen to sports radio. Uh, I can't handle more than like a certain amount. 
But there's one sportscaster that specializes in translating coach speak. And if you're familiar, if you follow sports, you know that coaches are so afraid when they get in front of the media to give out anything. And so they just throw out all these heavily repeated cliches. And so they just use all the same regurgitated cliches that, that mean almost nothing. And so the one sports talker specializes in translating. He decodes them. And so he'll play the clip of all the tired phrases. Then he'll say, ooh, translation. The owner is cheap. <laughs> Here's the clip, all this flower lens. Ooh, translation. My teeth not very good. <laughs> and so he just decodes it for what it is. So that's what we're going to do with Moses' excuses here this morning, and ours too. We'll translate them to what we're really saying. Number one, number one is this. I don't want change. I don't want change. That's what the excuse is translated to. I really don't want change. Moses had gotten used to the desert. He had gotten used to Midian. He, it's where he had settled. It was his new home. He had been there for decades. And so he's comfortable there. He's settled in. He doesn't want things disturbed. His life is going well there. He's married Zipporah. He's got multiple children. His children are adults now. He considers himself a Midianite. He's nearby his uh, his father-in-law, he's got, he likes being a shepherd. He likes that life. Uh, and so it's a place where he can enjoy his sunset years. And now the Lord is asking him to move, to uproot. 40 years is a long place to set your roots down. And not only is the Lord asking him to move, the Lord is asking him to, to go away to a place where his last memory there is trouble. Where he had been in trouble, where he had he had committed a crime, where he was wanted. And, and so... If there's any place he wants to move to, it's not there. He doesn't want to, he's, he's been hiding out and on the land. He doesn't want to go right back to the place where his deed was committed. He liked being obscure. He doesn't really want, he got very comfortable not having too much pressure on himself. He's saying, Lord, what you're calling me to do is public. And I don't really want eyeballs on me. I don't really want to be criticized. I don't really want to be scrutinized. I don't really want to be up in front of people. I kind of like being under the radar. I kind of like this, this nice, quiet shepherd's life in Midian. And so I don't really want it to be disturbed. Well, what a nuisance to be in the public eye. But yet God was calling him to accomplish something historical. God was calling him to accomplish something that was so significant in the sight of heaven and in the sight of God. And God continues even in the New Testament church era to call Christians and to call church members to something that is a significant accomplishment. And sometimes we look at accomplishments as working your way up the ladder at work or uh, making a lot of money, but in the sight of God, man, when a church member says, there's a ministry that, that needs to be done, there are people in our community that need to be reached, and whether it's teenagers or whether it's uh, the, the mentally handicapped or whether it's the elderly or whatever the demographic is, I believe God is putting a call on my heart to reach that demographic, and God has given me a burden for them, and so I'm going to go reach teenagers, and I'm going to, uh, there's, there's something that God's calling me to do. Along with that calling always means your world gets disturbed a little. It always means that your comfort is going to get disturbed and interfered with, and there's going to be some things you're going to have to give up, but it's it's worth it. Uh, what to say, I, I want to accomplish something for God. I'm going to go out and find teenagers. I'm going to find them wherever I can find them, and I'm going to show them how to be saved. I'm going to show them the gospel, and then I'm going to teach them the importance of church. And we're going to bring them in here on Sunday mornings. And I'm going to labor and study. I'm going to teach them Sunday school. I'm going to teach them the word of God. And I'm going to plan a program for them. And we're going to have activities. And I'm going to invest my life and pour my life into them. And I'm going to have them over to my house. And I'm going to uh, take them places. And, and I'm going to uh, give up all these things. And, and, and that is such a significant accomplishment uh, in the sight of God and in the sight of heaven but it's going to mean giving some things up. It's going to mean that weekends are going to be filled with outreach and filled with ministry and filled with planning. And so it's going to mean giving up some, some Netflix and it's going to mean giving up some uh, leisure time. And it's going to mean giving up some, some things that we might enjoy, some yard work or some downtime, but, but it's worth it. And in the sight of heaven and in the sight of God, it's so much more, uh, of a thing to accomplish than many of the things that the world sees as important. It, it changes eternity. And I wonder today, not necessarily in this church, but just across places where the Bible is preached, I wonder how many walk right past a burning bush. Moses, I'm going to turn to a side and see that. And I wonder how many see a bush burning, and they know that it's the Lord calling, 
And they know that if they listen to the Lord's call, it'll cause them to have to give some things up and give up some comforts and give up some leisure time and give up some things they like that they don't want to disturb. And so rather than walking up to the bush and listening, they kind of just pretend they don't see. They keep on walking so they don't have to give up the things that they don't want to give up. What God was planning on doing to release Israel from Egypt, surely at first, through the first nine verses that we read, sounded really good to Moses. Moses, this is the Lord speaking, I am going to free your people from Egypt where they've been for a very long time, including your own sister, including your own brother. And Moses says, amen, glory, hallelujah, I'm glad you're going to free them out of Egypt. That's good. Yes, you're right, that is good. They've been under taskmasters and they've been in bondage and they've been chained up. And I'm going to bring them to a land that floweth with milk and honey where there's no whips at their backs. And, and Moses says, Amen. Glory, you're so gracious and you're so kind to do that for them. What a merciful Lord you are. And by the way, I'm going to use you. Amen. Glory. Huh? What, what's that now? That's what's going on in the heart of, oh, well, not if, if, so that means I'm going to have to change. And my life is going to have to change. I was all for it when I thought it was somebody else. And that's, I think, explains the shortage of pastors today. As people sit in churches and say, amen, well, we need church planters, we need missionaries, we need to get the gospel out, we need to be out on our streets, but it should be somebody else, not me. I'm glad for it when someone else is doing it, but I don't want it to be me, because I don't want to have to change. When we make excuses to get out of serving God, it's because we care more about the life we wanted for ourselves than the plight of those we're called to deliver. Man, when the Lord spoke to Moses about affliction and oppression of your people and taskmasters and sorrow, his first, and, and he says, I'm going to release them from that. Moses' first response should have been excitement. Praise God. If I can have a part in that, I want to. They're oppressed and they're beaten and they're, they're in hard labor camps. And, and he should have been excited and relieved. And instead, he was annoyed for himself. Being disturbed bothered him more than their plight. Part of the power of the conviction of the burning bush, part of what, what made that burning bush moment so convicting for Moses is that, that much of what God was saying was, look how quiet and serene and scenic your life has been these last 40 years, while your own brother and your own sister are doing hard labor in a labor camp. That must have been pretty convicting. Ooh, yeah, I guess they are. <laughs> I guess they are. And so it's kind of amusing. <laughs> They're in a hard labor camp right now, too. It's kind of amusing to me that, that Moses would bring up eloquence. Because, yes, this, this call said that there's going to be some dialogue between you and Pharaoh. So, yes, there's going to be some speaking. But honestly, if you're in bondage and you're locked up, and you've been abducted, or you've been a, a kidnapped, or you've been a POW, and if you're held against your will, how much do you care about the eloquence of your rescuer? You just want to get out. You don't care how they talk. You know, you just, get me out of here. I want to get out of here. If you were uh, in a place like that, man, if I was in one of those Japanese POW camps in World War II, just get me out. I don't care if you speak Swahili. I don't care if you only speak in grunts. Just get me back home. Get me to the land that flows with milk and honey. I don't care how you talk. If you're in a burning building and, and you're worried about burning to death and somebody says, there's one way out. Come on. Come with me. None of you are going to say, but you have a list, so I think I'll stay here and burn. <laughs> Nobody's going to do that. And so they even bring up, well, I'm not very eloquent. No, it should have been springing them free. That, that He should have known that that's all they needed. And so he's given an opportunity to answer their prayer. He's given an opportunity, because what did the Lord say there? Their, their sorrows have come up on me. I've heard their cries. They've been praying. Somebody in the hard labor camp has been saying, send us a rescuer. And what an honor that God is saying to Moses, I don't want to make you their rescuer. What an honor that is. And it, God always works this way that, that almost always, there may be some exceptions, but almost always his call on a man's life, on a woman's life, is an answer to somebody else's prayer. It's amazing. How many testimonies have you heard from preachers and missionaries that say, well, here's my salvation testimony, and then here's how God called me into full-time service. 
And they, they go through the circumstances and they go through the preaching that they heard and they go through their decision-making process and it's, they agonize. And then God did a miracle and showed them that he was really in it. And they added up and they said, there's only one way this could happen. And so I know this is of God. And they rehearse all that. And then sometimes you find out about the people who God was calling them to. And then that man gets to know those people and spends some time with that people. And as they go through their history, he finds out later on that right around the time that man was agonizing and watching God work and God was showing them that call. Right around that same time, these people were calling out and saying, God, send us somebody. And you, you match up the time frames and he says, right around the time God called me was the time they asked that somebody would, God would send a rescuer. Our Lord is simply amazing in the way that he works in that regard. What an honor. So number one, I don't want to change. Number two, I know more than God does. What, are, what do our excuses translate to? Number one, I don't want change. Number two, I know more than God does. In Moses', in Moses, Moses excuses, <laughs> uh, he is telling God about himself. He is informing God about himself. He's saying, hey, God, here's some things about me that I'm not sure you know. That sounds a little backwards to you. <laughs> God knows me better than I know myself. Moses, his excuses show that he thinks he knows himself better than God does. He says, well, you know, who am I? Who am I? Don't you know that I'm a wanted man there? Who am I? I'm a, I'm a fugitive from that. I, I'm on the land. I'm wanted. I'm, my face is up in the post office in Egypt. And the Lord says, yeah, I know. <laughs> You don't have to tell me that. In fact, a little, while, a little while later on, the Lord tells him, by the way, all the men are dead which seek thy life. <laughs> so the Lord says, I know that you're aware. I'm aware of that, yes. <laughs> uh, and then he says, well, I'm, well, you know, there's an implication here about his age. Moses may have said, well, well I'm 80. <laughs> I'm 80 years old. And uh, you may say, well, but early in the Bible, they live longer lifespans. That's true. Joshua, Moses' successor, lived to be 110. And in the book of Genesis, Age, lifetime, lifespans are much longer. But by the time you get to Moses' era, 80 was already past the average lifespan. And you know who we know that from? From Moses. <laughs> because it's Psalm 90 that says, the days of our years are three score and 10, 70. And if by reason of strength they be four score years, 80, then there's then is their strength, labor, and sorrow for to soon cut off and we shall fly away. Uh, so Psalm 90 talks about a lifespan now is 70, maybe 80 if there's some extra strength to it, maybe a little longer. You know who wrote Psalm 90? Moses did. It's a psalm of Moses. So he's already 80, and Aaron's a little older, and Miriam's a little older. And, and he, well, so, but I'm too old. I can't do that. And, and you know what I love? I love the, the counter examples that we find in Bible colleges across the country. Alyssa went to school. I was close with some. There are some great servants of God and great men of God who are middle-aged already. And there are some that quit their full-time job, and they've got a mortgage, and they've got kids, and they've got a wife. And instead of just saying, well, yeah, but I'm tied up and I've already lived half my life and here I am, they say, no, God's calling me. Better late than never. And so they quit the job and move to Bible college. I know men like that. And I think some of the, the most fruitful and productive servants of the Lord are, are older, are, are not just the teenagers and the 18 and 19 and 20 year olds that are, that are college age. It's never too late to serve God. In fact, God says, yeah, I know. <laughs> I formed you. I designed you. I caused your birth. I knew who you were before you were born. I'm the one that keeps your appointment with death. Not only do I know how many years old you are, I know how many more seconds you'll live. <laughs> so, but I'm, oh, I don't have much time left. Oh, really? You're telling me about how much time you have left. I am the one who should be telling you how much time you have left. He says, but Lord, I'm slow of speech. Lord, Lord, let me tell you about the, the confidence level of my communication. Because you don't seem to know what my confidence level is. And the Lord says, I made your mouth. <laughs> all of your shortcomings, I am fully aware of them. I know all about them. Uh, and so you're not giving me new information. And then in chapter 4 and verse 11, Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto me. Not only does Moses think he knows more about Moses than God does. Moses thinks he knows the future better than God does. Lord, let me tell you what's going to happen. That's backwards. 
It's called prophecy. It's God telling us what's going to happen because we don't know. This is Moses. Lord, you don't seem to know what's going to happen in the future, so why don't I tell you? <laughs> That's, that is quite backwards. I'll inform you. When we make excuses, what we're really doing is pointing out to God the flaws in his plan. God's plans are flawless. They don't have any defects. But when we get in that excuse-making mindset, we are pointing out what we perceive to be flaws, problems in his problemless plans. <laughs> not, not wise. Lastly, number three, I don't believe. I don't want change. I know more than God does. And then the third one here is I don't believe. Moses was trying to disguise his unbelief in false humility. He was trying to disguise his unbelief in false humility. No, I'm just not really qualified. I'm just humble me, and I'm just a shepherd, and I just don't speak all that well, and I'm just old Moses, and so I couldn't do that. And, and humility is a good thing. Of course humility is a good thing. But true biblical spiritual humility doesn't make excuses. And so if excuses appear to be coming from a place of humility, it's false humility. Uh, <laughs> it's unbelief. This is the way I have it written in my notes. Unbelief is the pig, and false humility is the lipstick on the pig. <laughs> it wasn't humility that produced the excuses. It was unbelief. Here's how we know. Let me show you the scripture how we know that it's unbelief. Chapter 3, verse 18. God speaking. He says, this is God speaking to Moses. And they shall hearken to thy voice. They will believe you. Look at chapter 4, verse 1. And Moses answered and said, but behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice. God's like, I just told you they will. <laughs> Did you not believe me? And we know that unbelief was, a, was an issue for Moses. Uh, and we'll, come, we'll talk about that a little bit tonight. But the reason Moses was forbidden from entering the promised land was because he smoked the rock when he was supposed to speak to the rock. And so you read that and you think, oh, God didn't let Moses go into the promised land because of Moses' anger, because he smote it instead of speaking to it. No, God says it was because of his unbelief. The unbelief was the root issue of why he uh, struck it rather than speaking to it. Our excuses are not an expression of what we believe or disbelieve about ourselves. Moses tried to come off that way. We, we, but our excuses are not an expression of what we believe or disbelieve about ourselves. Our excuses are an expression of what we believe or disbelieve about God. Because the question wasn't whether or not we have limitations. The question is whether or not we believe God can overcome all of our limitations. He can believe, he's able, have faith, and where you're short, he is strong. He uses your limitations. First Corinthians 1, he uses you because you have limitations. To show his strength, to show his glory, to show his power. He can overcome everyone he knows all about. So that he gets the glory. If God can enable a donkey to talk, <laughs> then God can enable a man who says he's slow in speech to talk. And, and so the Lord provoked, I'll give you air and all these things. But I think of using our limitations as excuses. We had a missionary here a couple years ago named John Olson. John Olson's deaf, but God called him to preach. So he gets up in signs and has an interpreter. You know how many souls John Olson has led to the Lord? He could have very, well, I'm, I'm deaf, I can't do stuff like that. I know multiple other deaf preachers. And it's just, what a profound removal of our excuse to see that and say, will you just stop that? You're taking away my excuses, Brother Olson. Um, I think of Nick Vujicic. I don't know if you know who Nick Vujicic is. He is a 38-year-old man. He has been in evangelism for a little over 10 years. He's traveled all over the world preaching. I don't necessarily endorse all of his doctrine. However, the man has no arms and no legs. Yeah. He's three foot three. He's a torso and a head. And he's traveled this world preaching. Thanks a lot, Nick. You really ruined a lot of our excuses. It's pretty good there. <laughs> the apostles were unlearned and ignorant fishermen. But they preached the resurrection of Jesus Christ fearlessly. Although 
they were observed as being unlearned and ignorant fishermen. I don't think that they were as unlearned or ignorant as their detractors thought they were. Nonetheless, uh, how were they empowered to so fearlessly proclaim the resurrection of Christ in the face of martyrdom? The Great Commission. Jesus said, go ye to all the world, teach and preach. He said, lo, I will be with you all. I'll be with you. You can do it because I'll be there with you. I'll do it through you. I'll do it for you. Just yield to me and let me do it. Same thing God told Moses. Repeatedly throughout chapter 3 and chapter 4, Moses would make the excuse and the Lord will say, I'll be with you. I'll be with you. I'll be the one doing all the work. You'll just be the one who's being used. You'll just be the vessel and I'll take care of it. And so chapter 4 verse 18 is where he surrenders. Moses went and returned to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, let me go. See, there's his will. His will has changed. Lord, he said, father-in-law, I want to be right with you. I don't want to just remove your family here. Would you, would you uh, give me your blessing? I pray thee, return. I'm going to return unto my brethren, which are in Egypt. Verse 19, the Lord said to Moses and Midian, go, return to Egypt. Verse 20, and Moses took his wife and his sons and set them upon an ass, and he returned to the land of Egypt. He, he stopped making excuses. And he went, and the rest is history. And, and that ought to be our testimony. I stopped because of his answers. He was with me, and I went and did it. Whatever God has called you to, it may not be full-time ministry. It may not be teaching teenagers Sunday school, but it's something. God's got a calling on your life, and let's be as Moses here in, in chapter 4 and verse 20 and get to it and no longer make excuses. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. I would ask you this morning, do you know for sure that you're saved? 